Hello friends. Happy Sunday. Hope you're all doing great. Last week was general conference. Lots of things to muse on, uh, as always, that arise from, from that. One in particular I've seen, one talk in particular I've seen floating around with lots of criticism on social media, and that was the concluding remarks from President Nelson, who had a back injury, so he separately <clears throat> recorded his remarks and they played the video. This is the talk from which we get the latest uh, catchphrase, think celestial, uh, after Covenant Path being previously popularized and many other similar slogans before it. And there's various things that I think and feel as a result of that talk. Um, but what I want to focus on uh, today is the criticism that President Nelson is getting as a result of one sentence in this talk. And that sentence says, never take counsel from those who do not believe. Now, I've seen a lot of people, uh, ex-Mormons, soon to be ex-Mormons, people going through faith crisis and doubts and all sides of the spectrum, commenting all over social media, Facebook and Twitter primarily. And it's been rather interesting to see the way that people have taken this passage, uh, predominantly taking it as a single sentence and attacking it, basically a, a, a straw man fallacy, assigning to President Nelson a position that he doesn't necessarily hold or, or take, and then trying to torch him for it trying to burn down this uh, straw man that they erected. So as with all such things, I think it's best to first try and glean what context we can. Whereas, you know, a lot of these posts I saw, they just had like an image they created or, or in text, they just had the, the single sentence and that was it. And then all the, all the people were kind of piling on and, you know, oh, the church is a cult or, you know, whatever. So here's the context. I'm going to read two paragraphs from President Nelson's remarks, the second of which has the sentence in question. So he says, as you think celestial, you will view trials and opposition in a new light. When someone you love attacks truth, think celestial and don't question your testimony. The Apostle Paul prophesied that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. There is no end to the adversary's deceptions. Please be prepared. Never take counsel from those who do not believe. Seek guidance from voices you can trust, from prophets, seers, and revelators, and from the whisperings of the Holy Ghost, who will show unto you all things what you should do. Please do the spiritual work to increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. Now let's set aside that context for a moment and we'll come back to it. The remarks across social media were predictably stupid in a lot of cases. That's, that's not to say that there isn't reasonable criticism of, of you know, this sentence and this position. We'll talk about that. But the reactions, a lot of them, I would say most of them that I observed were, were downright silly. Here's a selected sample of a few that I encountered in the past week. So again, responding to this line of never take counsel from those who do not believe, one person said, what if my mechanic isn't Mormon? Another one said, so since I'm an ex-Mormon and a clinical mental health counselor, should my LDS clients ignore my relevant and evidence-based counsel because I'm not a believer? Should members only seek LDS counselors? How does this work outside the Mormon corridor? <laughs> Another one said, my toddler just drank seven fluid ounces of rubber cement. Quick, what's the number for poison control for believers? <laughs> I mean, bonus points for being, you know, clever and whatnot. But, uh, but the point here is that they are in intentionally ignoring and, and certainly not seeking context. Someone else posted, 
If any of you lack wisdom, remember, don't just ask anyone, only the .002% who believe like you. And then finally, another one, not finally, there were many more, but the final one I'll share, someone said, that's just cultism 101, quote, don't trust anyone outside the cult. So predictably, this became fodder for people who already have their grievances with the church. But the context is important. When taken in context of what he's talking about, even though he said it imperfectly, and for all we know, it's going to be revised when the, now it's the Liahona, used to be the ensign, when the church's magazine and the official kind of written version of the talk comes out. Uh, sometimes talks are adjusted for clarification and things, and so given the response, I think it's uh, likely that there will be some edits made for clarification. But even without those potentially forthcoming edits, I think the context makes clear what President Nelson is getting at. Because in the previous paragraph, he's talking about how people are going to attack the truth, including potentially people in your own family. Don't let that make you question your own testimony. Because this is part of prophecy that people would depart from the faith and, and give heed to seducing spirits. There's no end to the adversary's deceptions. Please be prepared. Increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. Seek guidance from voices you can trust from the spirit. And so in all of that context, wrapped up in those two paragraphs, is this sentence, never take counsel from those who do not believe. I think a fair and reasonable conclusion, and, and the only plausible one, this being President Nelson, is that he was meaning it in the context of spiritual counsel. Never take spiritual counsel from unbelievers. Like, let, let's remember for a second, this is the guy who works directly with the NAACP, right? Uh, he's gotten their award and they've been chummy and uh, there's been various kind of uh, coalitions or collaborations uh, with NAACP. You know, he often quotes non-members in general conference, uh, he went to, you know, medical school, and presumably worked with all kinds of people who weren't of his faith, who he learned from people. Not Like the idea that he thinks you should learn anything at all ever from people who don't share your faith is stupid. That's not at all what he's saying, and his life doesn't reflect that position at all. And so I think it's a very uncharitable response for people to try and pounce on a single sentence without context for what he was really trying to say. I think what he's really saying is not to seek opinions from the faithless on matters of faith, right? Don't, don't go to people who do not share your, your faith for input on, on resolving concerns with your faith. I mean, just you, you wouldn't take financial advice from someone who's bankrupt, right? You're not going to seek stock investment tips from someone who's just, you know, lost all their money. It would be ludicrous to to take input on a particular issue from someone who clearly has no relevant uh, expertise or insight or knowledge. So I think it's even more unwise to take spiritual advice from someone who's spiritually bankrupt. Now, a lot of the people I've seen complaining are people in mixed faith marriages or people who are still members of the church, but they have a lot of criticisms and, uh, you know, disbelieve some of the foundational tenets of the faith and so forth. And so, of course, you know, they're going to react negatively to this. Well, wait, so, you know, my wife shouldn't seek counsel from me or I shouldn't be able to be an influence on my family. And, you know, again, I, I think that's an uncharitable way of looking at what he's really getting at. Sure, if you've lost your faith, you have every right and free speech and all the rest to communicate your beliefs with your spouse, with your kids, with your friends, your coworkers, whatever. No one's questioning that you have the ability to share whatever your new views are. What he's simply suggesting is that those who still believe, those who do have faith in the core principles of the restored gospel, should be very cautious about who they listen to. Because if you're listening to someone who has already abandoned their faith, then you are being what you know Paul talked about earlier, seduced by uh, giving heed to seducing spirits from the, from the context and outlook of the gospel. To, to take heed from, to follow the advice of, and, and seek the input of people who are not a member of the body of Christ seems kind of silly if you truly want to stay. Like, that that's, doesn't mean don't have questions or doubts or concerns. I mean, <laughs> many of these 
musings are me, you know, offering my own questions and concerns and, and observations. I think that's fine. I think it's healthy to navigate and work through these issues privately, in, in conjunction with others, you know, having discussions, all of that is fine. But, but I think we have to do it charitably. I think we have to operate in good faith and recognize that someone like President Nelson in this context is simply applying to faith matters what all of us would do on financial matters. And that is seek advice from relevant people who have the answers that you want. Now, if what you want is validation of your doubts to find your you know, excuse and reason to leave the church, then fine, listen to whoever you want. That's not what he's saying. He wants people to stay in the church. He wants people to you know, maintain their testimony of the restored gospel. And consequently, he's saying, be careful who you listen to. A few scriptures come to mind. Uh, first one, 2 Corinthians 6.14 it says, uh, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? Now, throughout the scriptures, we see plenty of examples of the darkness uh, being hated for being called dark. Right, Like you look at all the wicked people throughout scriptural history and when the prophets would come and rebuke them and call them to repentance, what did they do? They wanted to suppress the light. They wanted to snuff it out. They attacked. They killed them because they couldn't withstand that light. They didn't want the light coming into their dark places. So people today who have an element of, we might say, darkness to them, or in different terms, we might say people who have abandoned their faith or, or lost their testimony or no longer believe, et cetera, et cetera. Right here, Paul is saying, what communion hath light with darkness? It's just a, I guess, clever rhetorical flourish, a different way of saying what President Nelson did. That on matters of faith, you should seek counsel from the faithful. Another scripture, 2 Nephi 32, verse 4 says, wherefore, now after I have spoken these words, if ye cannot understand them, it will be because ye ask not, neither do ye knock. Wherefore, ye are not brought into the light, but must perish in the dark. So here we have another interesting play on words with light and dark, but also this concept that there are people who can't understand. They don't want that light. They don't seek the answers. They, they ask not. And so I equate this with all these people who are pulling President Nelson's remark out of context. They're not seeking answers. They're not brought into the light. And so they perish in the dark. They're content to, you know, be a sideline critic and maintain their ignorance about what the true intent was, which I think is reasonable and, as we just saw from Paul, at least, biblical. Final scripture. Seek counsel from, uh, let's see, D DNC 46, uh, this is verses 7 through 8. But you're commanded in all things to ask of God who giveth liberally. And that which the Spirit testifies unto you, even so I would that ye should do in all holiness of heart, walking uprightly before me, considering the end of your salvation, doing all things with prayer and thanksgiving, that ye may not be seduced by evil spirits. Interesting connection back to Paul. Or doctrines of devils or the commandments of men, for some are of men and others of devils. Wherefore, beware lest ye are deceived, and that ye may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts, always remembering for what they are given. Now, if I'm President Nelson, and I'm asked to clarify what I really meant, since some people are taking it out of context, I would likely point to some of these verses and say, I'm just talking about that, you know? It's important to seek from the spirit and seek truth and, 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 and resist the doctrines of devils and seduction of evil spirits and, and the darkness and, and uh, the deceptions, right? We need to earnestly seek the best gifts. We need to pray. We need to have the spirit. That's really all President Nelson was saying. Now, one issue is when he says, Seek guidance from voices you can trust, from prophets, seers, and revelators, and from the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. And then he says, increase your capacity to receive revelation. I again reiterate the position that I take, which is not everybody 
we sustain as a prophet, seer, and revelator actually is. They have the potential to become so. But, you know, we have Moses who says, would to God that everyone would be a prophet, right? It's nothing special about him when they're like, oh, he's criticizing you, you know. Uh, you know, Moses responds. He's like, God wants everyone to be a prophet. And that's the potential. So in that sense, if there are people among us, and I am not putting myself on this list, who have developed that spiritual capacity and that revelation, they don't speak for the church if they're not in the established hierarchy and so forth. They, they, don't, they can't do any of that, but... I think it is proper and, and prudent to seek counsel from members of the body of Christ who have sought earnestly the best gifts and who do have, you know, the ability and the desire to share them and, and, and the fruits of them with others. So maybe this is a popular speaker or a podcast guy, even though I think last week or the week before I was criticizing how I think many people rely on these new podcast, come follow me podcasters, you know, for a crutch too often. Um, but there, there are people among us who aren't, quote-unquote, prophets, seers, and revelators, who, who are worth listening to, who can build our faith, uh, who can strengthen our testimony, who have developed the gifts of the Spirit and are worth listening to. So, I, I, you know, yes, prophets, seers, and revelators, obviously, when they are prophesying, seeing, and revealing, when they are in their administrative capacity signing letters from the first presidency saying that a certain thing that we're all pressured to get is safe and effective and a literal godsend, maybe not so much, <laughs> right? You know, I, I, I think in that context and other contexts I've shared on past musings, these are well-meaning but still fallible men with opinions and biases and, you know, cultural upbringing and blinders and whatever, that isn't to say they can't overcome those things or that where uh, appropriate God can intervene and speak and they can listen and prophesy. That potential is there. I just think the nuance exists that we shouldn't, quote unquote, follow the prophet as in follow the president of the church and, and believe and act accordingly with literally every word that is said or written as if it is from the mouth of God, right? Because only when they're speaking in God's name, only when it's actual revelation are they indeed prophesying, seeing, or revealing, which I think we as a church, as I've said many times before, really struggle with this. We lack the spiritual discernment. The leaders themselves don't clarify when they're speaking for God and when it's their own opinions. They benefit in our community from this presumption of prophecy that we all just kind of in you know believe, take the path of least resistance and believe that everything that they say is prophetic because we can't or won't do the work to try and understand what is and what isn't. We don't have a church community that accommodates that nuance, a culture, I should say, that accommodates that nuance. And so people t typically will just say, oh, follow the prophet, whatever we're told to do, we should do, and it's from God, and the end, without any accommodation for the imperfections of man and uh, personal opinions, though well-meaning and sincere, which do not rise to the level of prophecy. So, sure, we should follow prophets, seers, and revelators in that capacity when they are doing such. 100% agreed. Uh, and, and, you know, we should follow the Spirit and seek personal revelation 100%. But I think it's important to remember that, that the prophets, seers, and revelators are not the only possessors of truth. Uh, that, that, that there is a lot of richness and depth and meaning that can be found spiritually outside of the narrow confines of the established hierarchy of the church. I think this can be done with caution and with prudence. You know, it's not to say go, you know, buy all these new age books or, you know, crystals and like whatever, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever. Uh, but like, here's a few quotes, Joseph Smith. One of the grand fundamental principles of Mormonism is to receive truth, let it come from whence it may. And Brigham added on top of that, he said, if you can find a truth in heaven, earth, or hell, it belongs to our doctrine. We believe it, it is ours, we claim it. So this kind of grand view of the gospel that we believe truth, as Joseph said, let it come from whence it may. And that truth can be spoken by the mouth of babes who are not, you know, in their sustained capacity, prophets, seers, and revelators. But people, when moved upon, can learn and share the truth. 
So I, I think that the view of who we can and should listen to while having caution and not being seduced by spirits and deceptions and, you know, taking counsel from people who do not share our faith and want to bolster our, our testimony and our commitment to Christ, we've got to be careful of all those things. But as we are, I think there's a wider spectrum of, of voices that have obtained and are sharing truth. Joseph F. Smith said, we are willing to receive all truth from whatever source it may come, for truth will stand, truth will endure. The, the, the important thing to recognize, I think, is that w we all understand that past leaders, some, some things that past leaders have said are not true. And, and we accommodate that, we recognize it, but we do a very poor job at applying it to the present context. It's always in retrospect that we're like, oh yeah, that was their personal opinions. Oh yeah, that was, right. And, and that's happened to many past leaders whose views at the time seen as authoritative and divine because they were a prophet, seer, and revelator are later sidelined as, you know, policy, not doctrine, or opinion, not authoritative. So we allow ourselves to interpret past remarks in this way about our leaders. We do a very poor job at doing it in the present context. Now, this whole criticism over this sentence, I chuckled at because I came across this quote years ago that I've kind of embraced and share. I think it, I think I read it in a different, uh, worded a different way. But what I say is that we should never heed criticism of those from whom we would never seek counsel. We should never heed the criticisms of those from whom we would never seek counsel. So when I share that, mostly with you know younger people, uh, I say, look, you know, you're going to get criticized a lot, especially if you're standing up for something that's unpopular, but true. And and when you are criticized, you might take that personally. It might be really hard to hear people being mean to you. So the filter that you should use, that I like to use, is don't pay attention to any criticism unless they're people that you would actually seek their, their counsel from. If you got some, you know, butthead in your class who's picking on you and saying all kinds of stuff, well, you would never go to that guy for like tips or advice or help because he's a jerk, right? So why are you paying attention to the criticism if you would never value even his positive remarks? Um, Right, but but like a family member who you would seek input from, when they are critical, it's you know that it's grounded in love. They support you, they love you, they want to help, and so those criticisms are worth listening to. It's all, it, this all boils down to who you are listening to as sources of truth and inspiration. I think that's the whole message here that President Nelson was trying to convey, which is an appropriate message for people of faith and the members of the body of Christ who are being pulled to depart from that body from all sides. And again, that's not to say that there aren't concerns or questions or reasonable doubts or any of that, right? I'm not trying to invalidate any of that. But I think it all comes down to intent. How charitable we are in interpreting a single sentence like this, you know, and looking for its context, seeking the truth, seeking the answers, uh, and, and who we listen to, who we take counsel from. So... With that context, I think it's a reasonable message. I've seen a number of people very close to me over the years uh, depart from the body of Christ, as it were, to you know leave the church and disbelieve everything. And when I would see them share what the sources were of information uh, that they relied upon for their decisions, a lot of <laughs> none none of it. Uh, very little of it was from anyone who was trying to strengthen faith and commit them to Christ. It was all, you know, detractors and people who are now atheists and agnostics and, you know, mystics and don't believe in God or maybe you're still Christian, but, you know, not quite sure what that means. And, and these people are launching all these you know, tirades against the church and these, you know, friends and acquaintances of mine listen to those voices. It's the whole, you know, great and spacious building. Are, are we listening to the people who are pointing their fingers in scorn or are we clinging to the, the, the iron rod? I think that's what this whole message boils down to. Again, I am someone who is okay with questions and concerns and I talk about them openly and privately with friends and family and we work through them and we 
uh, discuss them and we try and understand truth. But I hope that you can see, at least for my intent, all of it is grounded in faith. My desire is to better understand truth. That sometimes there's <clears throat> corruption and ignorance and good intentions but incorrect positions. Sometimes there's deceptions, there's infiltrations, there's secret combinations. Like there's all these things going on, right? But the truth matters. And if we're really desiring at the end of the day to come out on the, on the side of truth um, and be numbered among the body of Christ to, to be the wheat and not plucked up with the tares that's growing amongst us, I think we have to be very cautious about who we heed counsel from. Because it can be very easy to be seduced by those other spirits, to join the, the critics who don't want to bolster faith and don't want to strengthen your commitment to Christ. It can be very tempting. And a lot of people have gone down that path, people close to me. So I think it just requires caution. And I think what President Nelson was perhaps meaning to say, but didn't adequately or, or you know, say in the, the best way that could be said, is something reasonable for members of Christ's church. He says, there's no end to the adversary's deceptions. Be prepared. Do the spiritual work. Increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. Um, I think these things are all reasonable. I think there are things that we should heed, and I think that uh, we should seek guidance from voices that we can trust. I think that's perhaps a little broader list um, than, than was offered in terms of prophets, seers, and revelators, and the whisperings of the Holy Ghost. But nonetheless, the, the counsel, I think, is sound. Um, we just really need to be cautious about who we... I mean, like right now, I was going to do amusing on the this whole Israel thing going on. Yesterday, I was like, oh, maybe I should, you know, ditch this kind of prepared musing, save it for later, and talk about Israel. And uh, I chose not to, but but I've been scratching my head because, like, yes, it's horrible, and yes, all these things are are problematic. But I posted on Twitter yesterday. I said it's important to remember that truth is one of the first casualties in war. Like, I don't know if you remember the beginning of Ukraine, all the propaganda, all the, like, the ghost of Kiev and, like, the fighter jet taking down all these people and the submarine, you know, telling them to F off and, and just all this propaganda designed to evoke emotion, fear, the desire for vengeance, you know, to, uh, <laughs> like, over and over again, I mean, weapons of mass destruction with Iraq or, or like, I posted on Twitter a few days ago, we have this new book that I'll probably do amusing on, um, about conspiracies. It's called the Tuttle Twins Guide to True Conspiracies, and it just came out. Um, it's at tuttletwins.com slash conspiracies. And the first one that I share of 20 is the story of Naira. Uh, she is a significant contributor to the reason why America was thrust, the U.S. was thrust into the Gulf War, the first war in Iraq. Uh, as uh, Iraqi soldiers invaded Kuwait, and you know this this uh, this 15 year old Kuwaiti girl named Naira later found herself testifying before a congressional committee, sharing what she claims to have witnessed in a Kuwaiti hospital, where Iraqi soldiers came in, ripped babies from the premature babies from their incubators, left them to die, took the incubators away. Naira is sharing this through tears. And the senators listening are just outraged when they soon after that voted on the resolution to go to war in Iraq. That resolution passed by five votes. Seven of the senators cited Naira's testimony as a basis for their decision. So passed by five votes, seven senators said that Naira's testimony influenced their vote. Naira's testimony was a complete fabrication. She was the daughter of the Kuwaiti ambassador who had been coached by a PR firm, Hill and Knowlton, they still exist, under a million dollar contract to deceive the Americans into wanting to go to war, tugging at their heartstrings, getting them to think that this horrible atrocity had happened, pulling them into the war knowing that once they entered, even if Naira's story was later found out, they would already be thrust into war and they could not extricate themselves until victory. Again and again and again, these deceptions exist. 
And so today, as we speak, rockets are launching all around Gaza and Israel and people are dying and horrible things are happening. But a narrative is being shaped and presented to the public, especially the American public, which finances both sides of this war, to try and influence them, to try to get them to believe things and act in ways through their elected officials or independently, you know, donating or whatever they're going to do, uh, but based on deceptions. So, so to say, you know, here's President Nelson, there's no end to the adversary's deception. Seek vo uh, guidance from voices you can trust. Increase your capacity to receive personal revelation. Uh, and, and all of these, like DNC, again, that you may not be seduced by evil spirits or doctrines of devils or the commandments of men. Beware lest ye are deceived. And that you may not be deceived, seek ye earnestly the best gifts. We do a horrible job at this. Horrible. Like when I wrote my book, Feardom, in 2014, a lot of it was like this post 9-11 authoritarianism of how the neocons were exploiting people's emotions to try to uh, encourage support for all this military conflict in, uh, in, in the Middle East. And I got done writing that book. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking like, okay, I know who buys up armies and navies and, you know, to oppress people and who's ultimately benefiting from all this chaos and blood and horror throughout the earth. But I write this book and I had the depressing thought that this book would never be irrelevant. It, it would never get stale. It was an evergreen book because what I talked about in there has happened since time immemorial, right? The, the, the deceptive tactics to exploit people's emotions to induce them to support things they otherwise would not like another conspiracy that we share in the the Tuttle twins book is operation northwoods here's uh the cuban missile crisis right the soviets are at our back door americans at the time didn't really want to intervene they didn't want to trigger world war three but there were a bunch of nut jobs who did want to and they got together and came up with a plan and somehow got an audience with the president to pitch their plan which called for bombing American cities, shooting down American planes, shooting down rafts of Cuban refugees, leaving the country in search of freedom, and doing all of this to make it look like Cubans were the ones doing the killing. Blame it all on the, you know, the Cuban communists to anger Americans in order to get them to support sending other Americans to go to war in Cuba to kill a bunch of Cubans. Well, these nut jobs that I talked about were the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military and the top brass of the Department of Defense who, who created this proposal, Operation Northwoods, that said, here's what we could do. We could, you know, kill all these Americans. These guys had sworn an oath to uphold the, uphold the Constitution to you know, protect American lives. And here they are literally proposing killing Americans to deceive other Americans to send other Americans to go fight and die in Cuba. So JFK was the president. He shot it down, and that's why it's not in the history books. Although, had it happened, I'm sure what would be in the history books would be like, oh, and once upon a time, these horrible Cuban communists did all these things, and for decades, school children would be taught deceptions as truth. I, I, I'm at my cabin this weekend, uh, and I've been all weekend writing a book that I've been working on for about two years now called Mind Wars. What's the subtitle? It's like uh, I chose between a few. I had my Instagram peeps help me. Mind Wars, Avoiding Deception in an Age of Manipulation. And, and so I've been thinking a lot about this, how, how we, are in a, we are in a mind war. And too, peop, too, too few people even realize that the war is happening. Like you would never think to send your, your adult children off to some war in, let's say, the Middle East if they didn't have body armor, weaponry, knowledge of the enemy, the rules of engagement, how to defend themselves, how to achieve victory and defeat the enemy, like you would think it would be insanely irresponsible to, for, for your child, your adult child to go off to war without those essential elements. And yet our children and us today are often in this psychological battlefield without armor, without weaponry, without knowledge of the enemy, how the enemy attacks, how we can attack back. So I've been thinking a lot about this over the past couple of years and, and why that happens. Like, like you, will lose, you will lose every war that you don't even know is being fought, right? 
Like, like if you go out in the Middle East and, you know, you're like, la, 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 right? I mean, like the people in Israel, right? You had all these, like, youth at a, at a peace rally, rave kind of thing, and they're all dancing. And all of a sudden, these, uh, you know, Hamas soldiers come flying in with parasail things, whatever those are called, and start shooting down into the crowd and killing people, right? Th- those, those poor victims had no idea that they were actually on a, what was about to become a battlefield. They were caught off guard, unable to defend themselves, unable to fight back. We are in a mind war. We are in an, an ideological, psychological battlefield. There are deceptions all around. The master deceiver is at the helm of all of this. We've been warned about this in the Book of Mormon that we're under condemnation still for treating lightly by not remembering and, and acting upon the things that we've received, which directly, as, as direct as you can be, says this is the reason that this society imploded was because of these deceptions, these secret combinations, all of their machinations. And, oh, hey, this is going to happen to you too. And the Lord commands you to awake, to arise, to, to stand up, to speak out, to fight back. So all of that to be said, I appreciate that part of the context from President Nelson's remarks saying that that in the latter, quoting Paul, in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, doctrines of devils. Um, there's no end to the adversary's deceptions. I, I think we underestimate the degree to which this is happening. And we think, oh, but so-and-so is my friend, or oh, I've always watched you know, Fox News, or oh, I like so-and-so reporter, or social media influencer, or presidential candidate, right? And, and we just, we let our biases and our preferences and, and social pressures and everything overwhelm our capacity to act independently based on truth to our own spiritual demise. So I think we need to fortify ourselves. I think we need armor. I think we need weaponry. I think we need knowledge. And at least scripturally, like my book, Mind Wars, is not a religious book. It's just kind of political, but... But spiritually speaking, you know, this is the power of the scriptures. This is why we need to search them. This is why we need to repent and remember the new covenant and, and not just the, you know, feel good stuff in the Book of Mormon about, you know, Jesus and another, like all of that. It's awesome. It's amazing. It's, it's revelatory. It's true. And, and everything is amazing about that. But as I've said in past musings, we collectively as a church community almost entirely, I mean, I'm going to go ahead and say entirely. <laughs> We entirely ignore institutionally and individually the second purpose of the Book of Mormon, which is to serve as a warning manual. And so we repeat the mistakes of the past because we don't learn from them. And la di da di da, we you know go out into this spiritual battlefield and don't realize what's at stake. We don't realize what's happening, and. We're just like, oh, look at me. I'm in the world, but not of the world. So I'm doing okay. I'm paying my tithing and, you know, going to church. So kudos to me, storing up my blessings in heaven. All the while, we are being bombarded with deceptions. We're believing many of them, in part because many of our colleagues and peers and friends and leaders do. And before too long, like, (laughs) I, I could... I got a lot on my mind because I've been writing all this stuff for a weekend. Maybe the final story that I'll share comes from Milton Mayer. Milton Mayer was a German-American Jewish journalist. And as World War II was breaking out, he felt all these emotions. As a German, he was perplexed as to how his country could go along with the Nazis. As a Jew, he's horrified by what's happening to all his fellow Jews. As an American, he's appalled at what's happening halfway across the world and this suppression of freedom. And as a journalist, he's curious. How is it that this could happen, that the Germans could go along with this? So he goes over to Germany, tries to talk to Hitler, and that didn't work out. He interviews all these Germans from different walks of life. He, he compiled all these in a book that I highly recommend called They Thought They Were Free. Milton Mayer, M-A-Y-E-R. And... To summarize this book, which is an injustice to the book because it's so interesting and so insightful in a lot of ways, but if I were to try and summarize it in one single point, it is this. These people said, look, if you had told us at point A where we were going to end up at point O, we would have just 
been alarmed and objected and no way, right? They would have resisted. They would have been horrified. But by contrast, at point A, they were only next led to point B, right? It was, oh, Jews just have to register their businesses. I'm like, okay, that's inconvenient and silly or, you know, whatever, but like, fine, right? You have to register your guns. You have like whatever it is. It was all incremental. Point A to point B. And they said, by the time that you got to point D, we saw point E coming and we're like, that's crazy. But we didn't speak out. Why? Because we didn't speak out at point A and B and C and D. We had conditioned ourselves into people of inaction. We, we were not conditioned to speak out. Quite the contrary, they would say. We, we were conditioned to be silent, to excuse everything, to believe the lies, the justifications by those in authority. And so at every point, they were incrementally led, deceiving themselves, allowing themselves to believe the deceptions, and, and habituating themselves into people who did not stand up, who did not speak up. So then they get to point O or Z or whatever, right? And, and, and all along, they had just incrementally gone with it. It's, it's the flaxen cords of the devil leading you carefully to hell. You know, no, one, no one's going to hell because they just choose that, like, they wake up one morning and, oh, I want to be an evil person, right? These things are always incremental. Always. I'm, I'm sure all this Tim Ballard nonsense, right? He didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to victimize all these women. It's all incremental. There's a justification here, an excuse there, right? All these things. This is how it happens when people fall from grace. It's incremental. It's the flaxen cord that's step by step filled with deceptions and all kinds of excuses and justifications to satiate your conscience and justify your actions. If we want to avoid that, we need to be aware of the degree to which these deceptions exist. The people who are manufacturing them, what their motives are, what their methods are, and, and, and that requires a level of intentionality and focus that I fear too, pe too few people have, right? Like we can't just watch football all day long and, you know, shoot the breeze and, and comply with any of this stuff. It takes work. It takes attention. It takes focus. It takes energy. But we're commanded to do it. And the price of not doing it is, is spiritual chaos and destruction. It's losing people diminishing our ranks because many people are abandoning the faith and, 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 and leaving the body of Christ. So the stakes are high. And, and sure, if I was in President Nelson's shoes, I might have said that stuff a little bit differently to clarify more and add a few exclamation points and, and convey the depth of the <laughs> problem that we're in so it's not just this la-di-da kind of you know thing that some might perceive. This is serious, significant stuff of eternal consequence. And, and for that reason, I think we should be, in cases like this, extra charitable in reviewing the remarks of someone like President Nelson to glean from them the correct advice that we should apply to our lives today. So I'll wrap it there. I'm going to go work on Mind Wars some more. Hope you're all doing well. Sundaymusings.org if you're new here and want to catch up with any of the uh, other stuff that I've mused about. You can search by topic and find what interests you and gosh how long have I been doing this now a year and a half coming up on two years I think in January I have a blast I find a lot of meaning from it I, I love reflecting throughout the week on thoughts and doing research and um, talking with other people about this stuff so I hope you benefit from it as well thanks for listening hope you guys have an awesome Sunday and we'll see you next week <laughs>